All right, now in Acts chapter 21, we're going to see here a continuation of the travels of, of Paul and, and all the other men that were with him. If you look at verse 1, it says, And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course unto Coos, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence into Patera. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unlaid her burden. So they're traveling, you know, they're making a course. Paul wants to make it to Jerusalem still. He wants, he wants to make it there um, for the feast. He wants to make it there for the Passover, for um, or the day of Pentecost. He wants to make it there and... Um, you know, they're just basically, they're finding ships. You know, they find a ship that's sailing in the direction that they're going. And that's where, what, basically what's going on here. They, um, they landed at Tyre because that's where the ship was destined to, uh, where its destination was Tyre. And that they unlaid all the, all the, the cargo that they were carrying. They're getting, you know, they're, they're boarding cargo ships that are already making the rounds. So they're, they're getting on these ships. They're making their way, it says in verse 4, and finding disciples, we tarried there seven days. So they found disciples that were living in Tyre that can put them up for, you know, for as long as they were staying there for, for a week. And it says, um, you know, when, when he tarried with those disciples, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. We're going to come back to this verse in just a little bit. But let's continue reading here. So in verse 5, it says, and when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way. And they all brought us on our way with wives and children. Till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. So here, you know, they're all walking them out. They're, you know, they're they're sending them off, saying goodbye, and they're on they're on the shore. They're they're walking by the by the sea, and um, well, I like what it says. It says we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And what I want to point out here is that you know, obviously the Bible teaches that we're not supposed to be like bringing a lot of attention to ourselves or praying so that men can hear us. And, and just be doing it to, to be seen of men, right? The Bible, the Bible tells us that we need to, um, you know, that we can pray in our closet and, and God will hear us in secret and he'll reward us openly. But I think it's also important when we see things like this, you know, it's not that the Bible's against open or public prayer. It's just the, the, the purpose of praying shouldn't be to be seen of men so that people look at you and say, oh, you know, you know this is such a godly, righteous person because... You know, look at their praying and, and look how pious he is. Like, that's not the point of it at all. But on the flip side, and what I want to point out here is that they kneel down on the shore and they pray. See, I think a lot of people today are intimidated or they're scared to pray to God or to do things in public because they don't want people to, you know, they don't want to, they're afraid of what people might think or, or you know, basically that's about what people are going to think if they see you pray. Now, we ought not to have that fear. Again, you don't pray just to be seen of people, but this is different from that. So like, you know, for example, I pray and I give thanks for all the food that I, that I eat. When I, when I eat food, when I eat a meal and sit down, I like to give thanks unto God because it, it's biblical. The Bible says, you know, giving thanks for, for, every, you know, for all that you receive. And, um, and that's something I like to do. Now, it's not just something that we do at home. If we're out, if we go to a restaurant, if we go to a fast food place, no matter where we are, if we're going to sit down and have a meal, we're going to give thanks unto the Lord, and, and we're going to pray to God and just and, you know, ask Him to bless the food, and we thank Him for what He's given to us. I believe that's biblical. And again, it's something that we do it, regardless of who's around, regardless of people look, if people whisper or say, oh man, look at that guy, look at they're praying over there. So what? You know, it's way more important just to, I mean, if it's in your heart, if you think that you ought to do that, you're like, we do, I'm not saying you have to do that every single time you eat. You know, if you, whatever, you, whatever you do, however you pray to God or however you give thanks, you do it that way. But don't let these factors of like, well, I'm in public and I'm afraid of what people are going to think about me. Don't let that impact your decision on, on what you're going to do. That's what I'm saying. And what they did, I mean, they got down on their knees and they prayed. If anyone were to see them, they know exactly what they're doing. And we shouldn't be ashamed to get down on your knees, out on the street, or out in public somewhere, if you're going to pray to God, you should have no fears about just getting down on your knees and praying to God. And who cares if people are going to look at you funny? It doesn't matter. Um, and, and obviously they didn't care here at all. So again, I'm not saying you have to go out and do these things or that you're not right with God if you don't get down on your knees in the street and pray to God. But what I'm saying is 
if you were going to do it, but you don't because you're worried about what people are going to think and you're worried about people looking at you funny or whispering about you, then that is wrong. Don't let that be the, the, the determining factor on whether or not you're going to obey God or whether or not you're going to pray or how you're going to do it. Um, and, and again, I know you can pray to God in your heart and in your mind, and I do it quite a bit. I do it very frequently. But I also don't believe that that should be the only way that you pray. The Bible talks a lot about people getting on their knees. It talks a lot about people using their voice and pleading with God with tears and with you know crying out. All these different ways that people talk to God, I think that you should incorporate those ways as well. I think we need to humble ourselves, get down on our knees, and spend some time audibly just praying to God. Um, I believe that's important. So there's many different ways to pray. I'm not going to preach an entire sermon about praying. I've already done that. But... Um, I just want to point that out here. How they kneel down on the shore. They're, I mean, they're out. They're in public. They're walking with them. And you they say, you know what? We're going to pray. We're sending them off. We love them. We're going to pray. That, I'm sure they probably prayed that God would keep them safe in their travels and that God would be with them. And they prayed down on that shore before they departed and, and, and um, went their separate ways. And it says in verse number 6, continue reading here. And when, he had taken, when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship and they returned home again. So they get on their ship. They get on their boat. They're going to continue on traveling, and the people, the disciples that they were staying with for seven days, they just went back home. Verse 7 says, And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemais, excuse me, and saluted the brethren, and abode with them one day. And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed, and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with them. So now they come to Caesarea, and that's where Philip is living. And if you remember, Philip was one of the seven that was chosen. It was Stephen and Philip, and I don't remember all the other guys' names, that were um, when the apostles, when, when basically the, the, the Greeks were complaining, the Gentiles were complaining that their widows weren't being served properly by the church. So the apostles were saying, hey, we're going to devote ourselves completely to prayer and to, and to preaching the word of God. We don't want to go and, and serve tables. So they appointed seven men. That, could, that can help do the work that was required of the church, of this daily ministration of going out and ministering to the people in the church, the widows and the other people that had need. And um, Philip was one of those men. Of course, Philip was the man that preached the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. And um, so here they're meeting up with Philip. They're staying with his house. At his house, And it says here, um, they, you know, they abode with, um, uh, where am I, verse 8. He says, which is of the seven, both in verse 9, it says, And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So Philip's got four, four girls. And it says, Here they're daughters, and they did prophesy. Now, I want to talk about that word prophesy, because that word prophesy is not always referring to future events. The word prophesy, very many times it is regarding things that are going to happen in the future. Um, and, and probably most of the time that the Bible is talking about prophesy, it's preaching, it's basically preaching God's word, but most of the times it's used as in the Old Testament where, where he's kind of preaching what's going to happen. So oftentimes when people prophesy, they're prophesying against the city, they're prophesying against people doing certain sins, and they're prophesying saying, hey, this is going to happen if you keep doing this. But it's not always talking about future events. For example, in Proverbs 31, uh, verse 1, the Bible says, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Now, Proverbs 31 talks about the virtuous woman. There is nothing about like your know, future or end time events or something that's going to happen in the future. That's just talking, that's biblical teaching and preaching about finding a virtuous woman, about finding a wife for you know the, the, the traits and the qualities that, that King Lemuel should be looking to in order to find someone that would be suitable for him for a wife. And that's all it's talking about. So when it says the prophecy there, that's not referring to an end time event. Also in Ezekiel chapter 37, in verse 9, the Bible says, Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. And if you remember, this is, this is a real interesting uh, chapter and story in the book of Ezekiel where there's all these, these dead bones and, and God brings them together like they form people and then they get the, their muscles and their flesh kind of like, you know, just, just form around these bodies. And then, um, and then here he's prophesying to the wind 
so that they can breathe upon, upon those, those dead corpses that end up becoming alive. It says in verse 10, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. And that's something to go read. I mean, it's a really interesting. It's, it's kind of bizarre. It's, it's a strange story, but it's really neat how um, God just creates this army of these dead people. And there's, and there's a whole kind of symbolism involved with that. I'm not going to get into that. But basically, what I'm, what I'm trying to point out here is that God tells them to prophesy to the wind. And his prophecy was just commanding the wind to give breath unto, unto those the slain that were there. That was the prophecy. So... Two good examples in the Bible. Prophecy does not always just mean, it's not always refer referring to, you know, end times prophecy as we call it today, right? I mean, usually when you hear the word prophecy, you're thinking it's, oh, it's a book of Revelation. Oh, we're talking about things that are going to happen. Now, oftentimes, like I said, that is the case, but it's not always the case. So when it says here that Philip had four daughters, virgins, which had prophesied, it doesn't mean that they were just going around talking about end times events. It simply means that they were preaching. Now, there's nothing wrong at all with women prophesying, with women preaching. But you have to understand, we have to make the distinction of what we're talking about here and what they actually did. So, in Joel chapter 2, verse 28, turn if you would, keep your finger on Acts 21, just flip back to Acts chapter 2. In Joel 2, 28, the Bible says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. This is a prophecy that's given in Joel. This was a future event where he's saying he's going to pour out his spirit. God's spirit, he's going to pour out on all flesh. He's going to pour out on the men, the women. He says, your sons, your daughters, they're going to prophesy. He says, the handmaids... In those days, will I pour out my spirit? Those are women. So look at Acts chapter 2 because here is the fulfilling of that prophecy. In Acts chapter 2, look at verse number 16. It says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Exactly what I just read for you in Joel 2 28. It says in verse 17 of Acts 2, But it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now what was going on in Acts chapter 2? Do you guys remember what was going on in Acts chapter 2? This was the day of Pentecost. This was when the disciples, when it was about 120 people, were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they all were given this gift to be able to speak with other tongues. And they went out and they prophesied, they preached God's word unto all of these various people that were gathered together at Jerusalem, people from all different nations, from all nations under the whole heaven, people who were come and congregated together, people who understood different languages. The disciples were able to preach the gospel and they were preach God's word to these people through a miracle because they had, they, they had been given this gift of being able to speak with other tongues. That is what was happened when it says here that they prophesied. They weren't telling all these people about it. They were telling them how to be saved. And this is the prophecy that we see that there is absolutely no problem with women going out, virgins, daughters, handmaids, whoever, all flesh going out and prophesying and preaching the Lord Jesus Christ, preaching the death, burial, and resurrection, preaching that people need to get saved. There is no problem with a woman doing that. And actually, we encourage it. We're commanding. You know, I believe women should be doing it just as much as men. We're going out and preaching the gospel to every creature. It's something that we're all called to do, and it's something that we all ought to do. But it's also important not to just take scriptures like this and, and take them out and segregate them and then apply them to mean that it's okay for women to prophesy in every situation possible and just say it's okay for a woman to stand behind the pulpit and preach in church. Because that is expressly forbidden. And if you would please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14 gives us a clear commandment teaching the opposite. Now, again, this has nothing to do, it's not against women or anything like that. But we just need to understand what these words mean. So when you see here, you know, Philip had four daughters and they prophesied. 
you know, you can't just take that out and say, oh, well, that means that they were they were all preaching in church and that they were pastors, you know, and you know, prophetesses in the sense that they were they were you know leading a church. Because that's not what they were doing at all. Now, did they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Of course they did. Did they, you know, if they were if they were prophesying, they were preaching God's word, but it doesn't mean they were doing it at the local church. It doesn't mean they were doing it behind the pulpit. It says very clearly, and there's there is no, I'm sorry, there's no way around. This gets a lot of people angry, this gets a lot of people upset, this gets people just just really turn off when they hear this. But let's just read God's word. There's not even gonna be much room for me to say anything extra. But let's just see what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 34. And you tell me how clear this sounds. Let your women keep silence in the churches. Okay, I didn't make this up. This is what the Bible says. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. Again, very clear. The Bible says that the women are commanded to be under obedience. It means they're commanded to be silent. It is not permitted. They don't have permission to speak in the church during a church service. It is not permitted for women not to speak. That's what it says here in verse 34. Look at verse 35. It says, And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So when it says there that Philip had four young virgins, daughters, that did prophesy, do you think that that means that they were up and speaking to the church? And not, not if they were obeying what, what you know Paul commanded here in 1 Corinthians 14. I highly doubt that because the Bible says it's a shame for women to speak in the church. Again, I didn't make this up, but this is exactly what the Bible says. There's, I don't see any room for wiggle or, or interpretation in this. It says what it says. Look at verse 36. It says, What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So again, Paul's even saying, look, these things that I'm writing unto you, these things where I just said, let your women keep silence in churches, he says, you need to acknowledge that these things that I write, these are the commandments of the Lord. This isn't Paul's opinion. This isn't some other man's opinion. These are commandments of the Lord. So we need to understand that, hey, there is a time and place for, for all these different things. But God is not ordained for women to be pastor of a church. It just shouldn't happen. It's never going to happen here. We're never going to have a woman stand up. And again, it's, you know, it's nothing against women. It's just this is what the Bible says. If the Bible says that it's not permitted for women to speak in church, then guess what? It's not permitted. And this is how we're going to operate our church. It's not permitted for women to speak in the church. Now, it's also important to note in verse 35, he's talking about if they will learn anything. This is during the learning time, which is actually what's going on right now is when the Bible was being preached and taught. When the teaching is going on, when we're looking at God's Word, and there's preaching going on, this is the time when, when women ought to be silenced in the church. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't all sing songs together in a congregation. That's not, the, that's not what the point of this is saying. This is when the learning time is going on, and that's why it says they could ask their husbands at home if, you know, if there's a question, if something comes up, and, you're, and if you're a woman and you're sitting in church and you hear something preached and you think, well, wait a minute, and you want to stop the service and ask a question, no, that's not permitted. You ought to wait and just ask your husband at home. Um, and husbands, if, if, your, if your wife's going to do that, then you better make sure that you can, you can provide an answer for them. You ought to be the spiritual leader of the house. But that's a separate, that's a separate sermon. Now, um, also, in one other place, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it gives the qualifications for a bishop, for an elder, you know, for a pastor, for someone who's supposed to be leading the church. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the, the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. He must be the husband of one wife. So if the bishop must be the husband of one wife, how is it possible for the bishop to be a woman? Because I'll tell you what, a woman is never called the husband. The woman is the wife. But in order for the, the bishop to be the husband of one wife, obviously the bishop has to be a man. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given hospitality, apt to teach. And then verse 4, it says, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Again, the woman's not the one that's supposed to be ruling the house. There's plenty of other verses that we can go to for that, but I'm not going to dig into that too much more um, tonight. But I just wanted to point that out since we saw that you know, Philip had, turn back if you would to Acts chapter 2, or I mean 21, sorry, Acts 21. 
Because we see here that, that Philip, you know, he's a great man of God. He had four, four young daughters, four virgins that, that prophesied. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I praise God for women that go out and preach the gospel. Praise God for women that, that can preach God's word, but they're not supposed to be doing that in the church. They're not supposed to be doing that from behind the pulpit. That's just not their role. It's not what, what God has intended for them to do. The, he's intended for the man to be the leader, and for the man to be the leader in the church, and for a woman not to usurp authority over the man. See, there's a level of authority within the church. That's why there's bishops and elders, because they're given a position of authority within the church. They're the ones that are leading and directing, and they're the overseers of the flock that, that God has given to them that responsibility and that job and that position. There's plenty of different positions of authority, and God has not ordained for a, for a woman to be in that position because that would be usurping authority over men. And that's just what the Bible says. Again, I'm not going to apologize for it. On the contrary, I'm actually going to preach it because there's the reason why so many people hate to hear that is because they're not hearing it. Because it's not being preached by, by the majority of churches. It ought to be. I mean, it's written in God's Word, but people these days, because they want to please people, because the times are saying that that's sexist and that you should, how could you possibly say that? Because that's the way the world's going. So that's the way that a lot of churches are going. Because they're just following the ways of the world and not following the ways of God. Well, I'll tell you what, the Word of God doesn't change, and we're not going to change with the times, no matter, no matter how perverted they get, no matter how far away they get from God, or no matter how close they get, we're not going to change because of where the world's at. We're going to just stick with the rock. We're going to stick with God's word. And that's what we're going to believe, and that's what we're going to preach, and that's the way things are going to be run in this church. So let's go back to Acts 21. Let's continue reading here in verse number 10. It says, And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. So as they're staying with Philip, Agabus comes down, he comes from Judea, and it says, And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus said the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So here we see yet another warning. And this is a warning for, that was directed for Paul. Now it says, Agabus... It says that, um, he said, thus said the Holy Ghost. When people are saying, thus said the Holy Ghost in the Bible, it means they're saying, this is coming from God. Okay, this isn't just me saying, giving an opinion, Paul, I don't think you should go there. He said, thus said the Holy Ghost. He says, so shall the Jews, and obviously he was with the Holy Ghost. I mean, it's written in the Bible here. It was the word of God that he was preaching. So shall the Jews of Jerusalem bind the men and with this girl. A girl is like a belt. Okay, so he finds Paul's belt. He binds up. Um, his hands and his feet, right? And he says, hey, whoever's belt this is, whoever's girl this is, the Jews at Jerusalem are going to do this to, to, the, to that person. He said, they're going to bind you up and um, they're going to deliver you into the hands of the Gentiles. And we see this warning and look what um, Paul answers in verse 13. It says, then Paul answered, what mean you to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And this is the same exact response that Paul had to this warning, this admonition. If you remember last week in Acts chapter 20, when, um, when he said in verse 22 of Acts 20, And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. So he's saying, look, I'm dedicated, I'm committed to going to Jerusalem. It says in verse 23, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. So even stuff that's not recorded here, he's saying that people are witnessing in every city that he's going to, saying, hey, bonds, afflictions, they're gonna, you know, they're they're abiding you in Jerusalem. He says in verse 24, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now, Paul had a good attitude of not, you know, just because he might be facing um, some kind of afflictions, he might be facing adversity, that he's willing to say, you know what? I, I, that's fine. You know, if God wants me to go through this affliction, if God wants me to go through this adversity, then, then bring it on. I'm willing to die for Christ. None of these things are going to move me. Now, it's great to have that type of mindset and that type of dedication to serving God. Amen. 
But the problem is here with Paul, he was a little bit misguided because he wasn't taking the warnings for what they were given unto him for. Now we're going to jump back real quick to verse number four because the question is, should Paul have gone up to Jerusalem? Right? We already see through all in, in Acts 20 and Acts 21, you know, they get a warning and say, hey, you're going to be bound, you're going to be delivered up to, to, to the Jews, or the Jews are going to deliver you up to the Gentiles. You know, all this stuff is going to come to you. Bonds and afflictions are going to come your way. He's getting all these warnings. But look at verse number 4 of Acts 21, where we just were. It says, In finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit. So these people, are they giving them their own opinion, or are they giving them God's word? If they're speaking through the Spirit, they're through, speaking through the Spirit of God. This is coming from God. This is coming from God Himself. They're speaking to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. So it's not just a warning of saying, hey, if you go to Jerusalem, bad things are going to happen. He's being, he's being warned, just don't go there. You know, he's given all these other things, and hey, all these bad things are going to happen, to steer him away, but you can still make the argument and say, well, he wasn't explicitly told not to go up to Jerusalem. Well, yes, he was. In Acts 21, verse 4, they said through the Spirit, saying, hey, don't go up to Jerusalem. Don't go. God is preventing, God's warning him. God does not want Paul to go up to Jerusalem. Now, I believe it's because of what's going to happen, which we saw already when we read this entire chapter before we got started. But we're going to see what happens. I think, I think God was trying to prevent him from doing it. Because, you know, God has foreknowledge. God knows the beginning from the end. Like, I said, like we've mentioned before, you know, God knows all of our sins that we're going to commit in the future. God knows the, the whole history of man. God's outside of time. He's not bound by time. But we are. And God deals with us knowing that we're bound by time. Even though God knows the future, he still, is, is, and he still has given us free will. And because we're bound by time, God deals with us in that way so that he can give us opportunities to change. He can give us opportunities to repent. He can give us you know, all these different things. And he can help lead our lives. And the decision truly is our own. We don't know the end. God knows what the choices we're going to make, but he doesn't make us make those choices. But um, God here is trying to, to steer Paul away in his command and say, don't go to Jerusalem, but let's see what happens there. When, God, when Paul does go up to Jerusalem, it says in, um, let's jump down to verse 18. We're going to skip over. It's a long chapter. It says, in the day following, Paul went in with us unto James. Or it says in verse 17, it says, And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. So now they finally make it to Jerusalem. The brethren received them. It says, In the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when they had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. So Paul's giving them an update and saying, Hey, God has done all these great things. He's used us greatly among the Gentiles to do all this great work. And he's declaring it unto him. Verse 20 says, And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. So they're happy. They're happy to hear that all this stuff is going on with the Gentiles, right? They're happy to see that people are being led to Christ and that Paul's got this great ministry going on to the Gentiles. It says, They glorified the Lord, in verse 20, and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law, and they are informed of thee, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Now, he's kind of like, not really full on rebuking them, but he's saying that, look, they're hearing about you, and they hear that you're saying that thou teach all the Jews to forsake Moses and that they shouldn't circumcise their children. Now, let me ask you this. Should they be circumcising their children according to the Bible at this point? Absolutely not. This is something, you know, the Bible says that circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Paul himself was very adamant and very clear in all the scriptures about, about the circumcision and how it no longer applied to them anymore and that they didn't need to do that anymore. But here they are, they're saying, hey, we're hearing that you're preaching this stuff, so what about it? And it, <laughs> I thought all this stuff was settled back in Acts 15. 
right? It's the same group of people. This is James. They went in to see James, and James is bringing this up to them. And James is the same one back in Acts 15 when they came down, when they were disputing about the same exact thing, saying that people, it was needful to be circumcised, if you remember that sermon. They were claiming, hey, it's needful that, we need, that, that people be circumcised in order to be saved. And Paul and Barnabas were like, no, it's not. You don't have to be circumcised to be saved. You just have to have faith. And they went down and they had this big meeting, you know, and they had Peter and the apostles and they had all these people gathered together. And that's when Peter says, hey, look, you know, it's delivered unto me that, that, you know, there's basically no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, that you shouldn't call any man uncommon or unclean. And that, um, you know, he basically confirmed what Paul was saying all along, that you don't need to be circumcised. Yet he comes back to Jerusalem and now they're saying they're bringing up the same exact thing, and he's saying, "Well, what you know? What are you doing? What do you what do you mean? You're telling people they they hear all this stuff. They hear that you're saying not to circumcise them. So let's see what he asks them in verse um, or in verse 25. It says, or I'm sorry, verse number 22. It says, "What is it therefore?" So he asks them, "Hey, well, what is it? Well, what do you believe? You know what?" Um, he says, the multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. He said, they're going to hear that you're coming, and they're going to want an answer for this. All the, all the stories that they're hearing about you saying, hey, you don't even have to circumcise your children. And um, it says in verse 23, he says, do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. So they're asking them here, they're saying, okay, look, this is what we want you to do. There's four guys here, they have a vow, and we want you to go with them, purify yourself, go into the temple, and do all of these things that are written in the law so that people can see that you don't forsake the law and that you're still following the law. And that's what they want him to do to kind of prove, so that Paul can prove to these other people that are hearing that he's saying, don't circumcise your children, that it's a proof that no, 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 Paul does obey the law, Paul does follow the law. And um, he says in verse 25, it says, as touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from straying and from fornication. So they're kind of appeasing him there a little bit. They're trying to, to use it saying, okay, well, you know, for the Gentiles that believe, you know, we're saying all they have to do is, um, you know, keep themselves from things offered to idol, from blood, from strangling, from fornication. He said, we're not telling them to be circumcised. If they're not circumcised, he's saying, no, they don't have to be circumcised. This is where they're saying, this is the conclusion they came to after that whole meeting in Acts 15. But that's wrong. It's a wrong conclusion because it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, they don't need to be circumcised. They don't need to be keeping that law. But basically, James is still thinking here that there's two different sets of rules. That there's one rule for the Jews and there's one rule for the Gentiles. And that's why he's telling Paul, hey, you need to show these Jews that believe. He says, they're zealous of the law, but they hear that you're saying these things. You need to show them that, that you are following the law, you obey them. And this is where Paul sins. In verse 26, it says, Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. Now, this is why that's such a sin. This is why it's such a big deal that Paul did this, and he never should have done that. And there's so many things to bring up here because... For one, just because somebody who seems to be a pillar in the church, right, like James, and, and he was, right, I mean, he was, a, he was a great man of God, and he was used of God, but he was wrong. And just because someone's telling you to do something, you know, you got to be careful and just make sure at the end of the day that what's, what's coming is from the Bible, is from God's Word. And you're not just end up doing something because some pastor tells you to do it. You can't just take what someone says and just assume, well, they know so much more about the Bible than I do, so I'm just going to listen and just do whatever it is that they say. That's a dangerous attitude to have. Now look, the pastor should be guiding you in truth, and they should be teaching you what's right, but at the end of the day, we're all responsible for our own actions. 
You cannot rely on an excuse and say, well, he told me to do this, so that's why I did it. And um, it requires you to be strong. It requires you to be rooted down in the faith and to know the Bible for yourself. And you ought to know the Bible for yourself. It's going to require a lot of work for you to do that. But, um, but you know, we all have that responsibility. Now, we know for a fact that Jesus Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and that when he came, there's a lot of ordinances that were done away, and a lot of things that were changed, and I'll tell you what was changed, what the big thing that was changed was the offering, the sacrifices. The animal sacrifices were completely done away because Christ was offered one time, he shed his blood, those, all of those sacrifices were just a picture of, what, of, of Christ that was to come and to take away the sins of the whole world. Paul knew this. He knew that the, the sprinkling of blood of goats can never take away sin. And they should have known that even in the Old Testament they, they were supposed to know that. That these sacrifices were just a symbol of the Christ that was to come. Now after Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross, hey, those animal sacrifices were to be done away. That's why the veil was rent in twain. If you remember when Jesus Christ died on that cross, that veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place, the way into the most holy place was separated and divided when Jesus Christ shed his blood and his body was divided for us because he is the way into the most holy place. He is the way into heaven. He, he rent that veil in twain. The, the sacrifices were supposed to have ceased when Jesus Christ was the sacrifice, when he finally offered up himself. Hey, these sacrifices were to be done away, yet Paul joined these men in their vow that they made, and the days of purification is until an offering should be offered for everyone. He was going to be he was participating in his Old Testament law of the purifica of purification and, and the vow, and um, where an offering was going to be made for him, for every one of them. It says that is why it's so wrong. Now in Numbers chapter six, turn back to Numbers six real quick. We're going to see the Old Testament law that talks about people who make this the Nazarite vow. Because it says here, you know, these men, they, they had uh, shaved their heads because they had a vow. And this is the conclusion of the vow. And we're going to see a little bit about what that vow entails or what, that, what, the, you know, what the offering, what the, the whole um, ritual was for people that did this. In Numbers chapter 6, verse number 13, the Bible says, And this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and he shall offer his offering unto the Lord, one he lamb of the first year, without blemish for a burnt offering, and one you lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering, and one ram without blemish for peace offerings, and a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, and wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil, and their meat offering and their drink offering. And the priest shall bring them before the Lord and shall offer his sin offering and his burnt offering. And he shall offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord with the basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall offer also his meat offering and his drink offering. And the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shall take the hair of the head of his separation and put it in the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offerings and the priest shall take the sodden shoulder of the ram and one unleavened cake out of the basket and one unleavened wafer and shall put them upon the hands of the Nazarite after the hair of his separation is shaven. And the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. This is holy for the priest with the wave breast and heave shoulder. And after that, the Nazarite may drink wine. This is the law of the Nazarite who hath vowed and of his offering unto the Lord for his separation, beside that that his hand shall get, according to the vow which he vowed, so he must do after the law of his separation. This is what Paul was participating in. This is what Paul allowed himself to go through. Now think of the damage that this did for his cause. I mean, you have a lot of people. There's a, there's changes going on in the church. It has to. There's you know obviously this is a transition period where people have to learn and have to understand, hey, this is the way things have been done for a really long time. These sacrifices, these vows, all of these things that happen. But now that Christ has come, and now that Christ is offered up, you know, 
They needed to try, they needed to switch from that and not do those things anymore. And Paul was the, the main proponent that helped to steer people in the right direction and to teach them God's word concerning these things. And here he is, the strongest advocate that's out there saying it's not needful to circumcise. We don't need to keep these, these carnal ordinances. We don't need to be offering up these sacrifices. Here he is now, succumbing to the pressure of James and saying, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just participate in this just to show you that I keep the law too. And I believe this is what God was trying to keep him from doing. Because it, it, it causes great damage. I mean, people see that. Your actions speak, in many cases, so much louder than your words. When you say one thing and do another, that's going to completely hurt your cause. You're going to get discredited. People are going to have a hard time believing what you have to say. And look, we're all human. Okay, so in some aspect, every single one of us is a hypocrite. If I stand up here and preach about some sin, I preach against it, and then later on I end up doing it, that makes me a hypocrite. It does. Okay, now I shouldn't just be full of hypocrisy and just judging other people when I'm completely guilty of it, but hey, as a sinner, we are going to fall at times and, and we're not perfect. So we all have a, a level of hypocrisy in that we sin, but any time it's in, especially when it's known, especially when it's public, like just you're just doing something and you know you're doing it, that makes it even worse. I mean, Paul went along with this, and it was something that was just out for everybody to see because they saw him. They saw what he was doing. And, um, and that just hurts his testimony. It hurts what, you know, God's word that he's trying to preach and to teach unto them when he allowed himself to get caught up into this and to sin in this way. And think about that in your own life. I mean... You know, you need to be an example to the believers and to the unbelievers. You need to be an example of what a Christian should be in your life. If someone looks at you and says, hey, I know that that person believes in God. I know that that person believes in Jesus Christ. There's a Christian. They're going to be looking at your lifestyle. And if they see you just into all kinds of wickedness and in all kinds of sin, whatever they see you doing, they're going to think, well, that person's a hypocrite. And they're not going to want to believe anything that you say. Regardless of the actual truth of it, I mean, if you're going to just preach in the gospel and tell about Jesus Christ, hey, why would they want to believe? They already see, oh, well, you believe in this and you're not, you're not doing anything with it. You're, you know, you're, not, you're not living that way. Why should I believe you? Um, you know, it's just, it's just going to hurt your testimony. Also, people are going to look at you and say, oh, well, if that's the way a Christian lives, I don't want to be a Christian. You know, depending on what's in it, might, they, you, know, you might be into or whatever. They'd be like, oh, well, if that's what Christianity is all about, I want to have nothing to do with that. And you hear that all the time. It's, it's real. It's a reality. It happens. And unfortunately, people can't separate, you know, what certain people do from what the truth actually is and what God's Word says. And a lot of people have a hard time understanding that, hey, people are sinners. You can't put your trust in one man unless that man is Jesus Christ. And that you can't, you know, anyone else, hey, we are sinners. And if you, com if you just completely rely on some other sinner, on some person, you're going to be let down. Uh, people, people have a hard time understanding that. And a lot of times it pushes them away from church. So we need to be extra careful for their sakes that, that, that we'll see this stuff. And also for God's sake, I mean, just not to sin by him. But um, this is a big deal. I believe this is a major sin that, that he's doing here because it, because it hurts his testimony so much um, that he's preaching against this stuff. And now he's kind of associating himself back with those Old Testament laws that he was trying to teach that they didn't they, they didn't need to obey, and rightfully so, they didn't need to be following these, especially having a sacrifice offered for you. That is something that they never should have done. Now, um, and it's also important to notice here, too, that Paul, such a great man of God, such a great Christian, and you'll find this with anybody in the Bible, just because somebody does something in the Bible does not automatically just make it right. You need to understand, when you read the Bible, there's lots of things that happened in the Bible that, that great men of God did that were not right, that were not justified. I mean, you could say, um, you know, what about David? He had multiple wives. So is it okay just to have a polygamous relationship and just have multiple wives? No, of course not. The Bible says, because God commanded not to multiply wives unto yourself, the Bible says that, you know, God made man and woman, and these two, these twain shall become one flesh, not these six or seven shall become one flesh with, with one man. No, it's not what he said at all. He is ordained for one man and one woman to be made flesh by becoming husband and wife. And um, it was never intended to be 
for multiple wives or multiple husbands or whatever. You know, that's a perversion of God's word. And just because someone does something, it doesn't make it, it doesn't automatically make it right. That's where we have to go with the clear statements and the commands of the Bible where you can say, okay, well, the Bible says not to do this, but then we see somebody doing something different. Well, obviously that person's in the wrong. They never should have done that. So just remember that when you see, because a lot of people like to use that as an excuse. They'll see, oh, we'll see Noah. Noah got drunk. Noah was a righteous man. Hey, he, was a, you know, he's a, he was a preacher of righteousness. In fact, he was so righteous, God spared him because he was so righteous and killed everybody else. So if Noah got drunk, well, it must be okay then for me to get drunk too. Wrong. You need to look at all the scripture. It says it's not right to get drunk. It's not, you know, you need to be sober. And um, just apply that to Noah and say, well, what Noah did there was wrong because he's a human being because he's a sinner. And again, going back to my point earlier, there's a story that... Um, I know it's stuck in my wife's head a lot, and it, and it makes me angry too. We went to, um, I had a good friend that, that um, he had, he had his, his infant child baptized, right, um, by, by some false prophet. They, you know, they sprinkle the babies, and um, we met up with them afterwards. Right? We're not going to be a part of that at all, right? We're not going to go... And, and be a part of that ceremony and support this whole thing of infant baptism by some false prophet that's sending people to hell. Um, and we probably ought, shouldn't have even gone to the, to the lunch. We, we ended up meeting up with them at the lunch afterwards. And I actually, you know, kind of approached them and talked about that, but that's a, that's a whole other story. But basically what happened there was, so they're celebrating, right? And this, this priest... You know, I don't know if someone bought him a shot or something of alcohol, right? And they do this toast, and he takes this shot of, of some hard liquor, right? And my friend's brother says, oh, well, if a man of God can do it, then I can too. And that makes me angry, because here you have a person... They see this man, they think he's a man of God, obviously he's deceived, I mean he wasn't saved, he didn't know any better that, that you know, this guy that, that's called himself a priest, he's no man of God. But this is what he sees, and he says, oh okay, well that makes it okay for me. And people are going to be looking at you that way too, and the more bold you are, the more brazen you are, I mean this guy's just taking a hard liquor, just going boom, and just knocking it down, not batting an eye, hey if he can do it, then it must be fine. And people are going to look at you that way. And um... Regardless of right or wrong, that's what's going to happen. And you're going to influence people because there's going to be a lot of people, whether you know it or not, people are looking at you. And it might not be the people that you think either. Maybe it's little children. Maybe there's some little children that look up to you and think, oh, wow, for whatever reason, they like you, they think you're cool. Hey, be careful what you do. Be careful the way you act. Be careful the things that you do because it's going to be somebody that's going to be looking at you and, and it will be influenced by the actions that you take. So be careful with... with with your life and how you walk with God. So anyways, but let's, um, let's keep reading here because we're going to see what happens as a result of this now. See, Paul says, okay, you know, he goes along with it. And he's sitting there, he's waiting, and it says um, in verse 27, and when the seven days were almost ended, so it's almost the end of their purification period where they're waiting for the sacrifices, it says the Jews which were of Asia... When they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. So these Jews that were from Asia were there, and they see Paul, and they're saying, no, we got to get this guy. This is the guy, right? Let's get him out of there. They see him in the temple, and this is what they were saying. See, they are making false accusations of him. It says in verse 28, it says, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. And further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. So first they're saying, okay, yeah, this is the guy. Because, see, and James knew when he came in that there were these people that they had, they had an axe to grind with Paul. They didn't like what they were hearing that Paul's teaching against circumcision and against keeping these different aspects of the law. So James was trying to quiet them down. But what happened? They see him. They see him in the temple. That even infuriates them even more. And then they even lie and say that, um, you know, he brought Greeks into the temple. Because, you know, the heathen weren't allowed to go into the temple. God had sanctified the temple. It was not allowed for anyone else to go into the temple. It was only allowed for the Jews. 
But, um, you know, they're saying that he brought Greeks in. It says in verse 29, For they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus an Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Now, does that mean that Paul brought him into the temple? No, they just, they assumed. They supposed they just made this assumption that, well, since we saw this Ephesian with Paul, he must have brought him into the temple too because he teaches that it's, you know, that you can do whatever you want and you don't need to obey this law, so he must have brought him in there too. So they just start spreading these lies about him. And then this gets everybody angry. This gets everyone upset. It says in verse 30, it says, And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, Tidings came under the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in uproar. So they're ready to kill Paul for this. They're so upset with him. They're infuriated that they see him in the temple. And then they think that he brought a Greek in the temple. Now, this is exactly why I think that God was trying to warn him. And I think the lesson that we can learn out of all this is don't compromise. Don't do it because these people are never going to be satisfied. You see, the, the people here... I, I believe that James was trying to just like get him to compromise a little bit and just say, okay, well, look, just, just do this one thing. Do this thing that we're asking you to do. It's not that big of a deal. Just, just go in with these guys. Just kind of show that, hey, I keep the law too, so that these other people that have been hearing about you, they'll, they'll just, they'll kind of go away, right? They won't be, they won't be so mad anymore. They won't be so worried about the things that they heard. They'll just be quieted down. We'll just will appease them by you going into the temple and you just kind of showing that you keep the law. And that was a huge mistake. When you just start compromising, the people that you're trying to appease, they're never going to be satisfied because now they're just going to want more. And it only ended up hurting his own cause, the compromise. It's only going to end up your cause, the compromise. If you know what's right, if you know what the Bible says, don't ever back down, don't ever compromise, don't ever say, okay, well, I'll give up a little bit here because all these people are upset. We'll just we'll calm them down and, and we'll get some unity or whatever, whatever the case may be. You give someone an inch like that, they're going to want to buy. They're just going to keep on. They're never going to be satisfied. And you see here, were they satisfied at all with the fact that Paul was in the temple with these men, you know, purifying himself? No, it made him even more angry, angry to the point now where they're going to kill him. Were they going to kill him before? Because it says in verse 29, for they had seen before with him in the city, Trophimus. So they had already seen Paul. Now at that point, were they so mad that they were just going to take him and kill him? No. They already saw him. If they wanted to take him and kill him, they would have tried it then when they saw him in the city with his, with his buddy the Ephesian. They weren't that upset at that point. But after he compromises... After he goes into the temple, after he decides to say, okay, well, I'm going to show these guys I obey the law, that's when they get upset because it wasn't good enough for them. And now it's even worse because instead of him being adamant and being saying, no, it is what the Bible says. This is what God said. We don't need to circumcise our children. We don't need to follow these, old, these, these laws, these carnal ordinances that are done away with. I'm not going to go into that temple. You're not going to offer a sacrifice for me. That's wrong. Instead of him saying and keeping that position, he compromised. And as a result of that compromise, he's almost killed. They all, I mean, they, they almost had him killed. We're going to see what happens here, too. And um, so all Jerusalem's in an uproar. The Bible says in verse 32, you know, the, um, the centurion hears it. This captain of the band, he hears that, that there's this uproar, there's riot going on. So he immediately takes soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. So these guys are literally just going to be beating Paul to death. I mean, they're just trying to kill him. They're beating him up. But when they see the, the, the police arrive, you know, they see the authorities arrive, they see these, these soldiers come in, then they just, they stop. Right? They stop beating Paul. And um, then the chief captain came near, verse 33, and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. So he comes in a situation, he sees all these people just beating him, and he's just like, what did you do? You know, he's like, he's like, okay, you know, arrest this guy. They shackle him so he can figure out what's going on and why all these people want to kill him. In verse 34, it says, And some cried one thing, and some another among the multitude. And when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, 
he commanded him to be carried into the castle. So he's saying, look, you know, these guys are saying one thing, these other people are saying another thing. I can't figure out what's going on. He says, we're just going to take him into the castle. Because the people were still upset. I mean, there's still this mob out there. Verse 35, it says, and when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. Born means that they were literally carrying him. They were bearing him. That's what born means with the E, that born, they're bearing him. So they're basically, the soldiers are carrying him out. It says, for the violence of the people, because they were worried that the people were just going to literally just like rip him apart. The people were so violent and were so just set on, on destroying him that the soldiers had to literally like, like drag him out of the crowd and just drag him into the temple. He's shackled, he's bound up, and it says, um, so he gets to the stairs of the castle. Verse 36, it says, for the multitude of the people followed after, crying, away with him. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? So Paul asked the chief, you know, he's been carried away, and he said, Hey, wait, can I, can I have a word here? Can, you know, can, I, can I talk to you? And of course, he asks him in Greek, and the, and the captain's kind of shocked because this is all the Hebrews, right? These were all, these were all the Jews, and um, he was kind of surprised that Paul could even speak Greek. And um, he says in verse 38, so we see here that he's got a different perception of who Paul even is. He says in verse 38, Art not thou that Egyptian which before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers? Now, this is kind of interesting, and you can't help but, but, but see the, the, in some level, some kind of connection between Moses and, and Paul. Now, I'm not, convinced, I'm, I'm not sure if, if, this, um, if this captain thought that Paul like, was Moses in some way. I mean, the people at that time... They had these belief in other gods and a lot of strange, you know, um, false beliefs. And maybe they believe in reincarnation, all these other things. Who knows, right? So it's possible because the facts don't line up. I mean, Moses didn't lead 4,000 people in the wilderness and they weren't murderers. But the way I look at it, I mean, he could have thought like, okay, well, he got the number of people wrong, obviously. But maybe he thought like, because Moses was a Jew and he came out of Egypt, right? And when they came out of Egypt, all the firstborn of, of the men of Egypt had died. So in his eyes, from, from a different historical perspective, from someone who's not a believer, can look at that and say, oh yeah, these guys murdered all those people, and then, and then he led them out into the wilderness. And because maybe he understood here that, that Paul was a figure that was causing a great stir and was kind of a leader in the church, that, that you know, he might have known that much and just kind of thought like, oh, this is like a reincarnation of Moses. You know, that, that guy that, that came out of Egypt that was a murderer that led 4,000 people with him. Um, I don't know if that's the case or not, but that's, that's kind of what, I, what I've always thought when I read this. Um, because otherwise, he's just, just associating with, him some com from somebody, with somebody completely different. Um, in any case, he doesn't quite know who Paul is. Verse 39 says, But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. So he's saying, look, I'm just asking you, please, just let me talk to the people. And, um, you know, he tells them, you know, I'm, I'm a Jew of Tarsus, right? I'm, I'm not um, this guy who you think I am, um, an Egyptian. And again, see, that's, that's the other weird thing about 38. He says, he's thinking that he's that Egyptian. Yet, it's probably pretty obvious that he's a Jew. That Paul, Because Paul was a Jew. I mean, he's a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. He, he looked at him, though... And the Egyptians look different than the Jews. And um, so it's just, it's, again, it's one more thing that's just kind of interesting. That he's there. Aren't you that Egyptian? And um, even though he was a Jew. But um, anyways, he explains to him. He said, look, I'm a Jew of Tarsus. He says, like, I beseech you, I'm asking you, just let me speak to the people. It says in verse 40, And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, so then we're going to get his whole speech that he makes in chapter 22. But he starts speaking to him in Hebrew. Because that usually, that's always in time past, that's made the Jews like, like listen to him even more, is when he would speak to them in the Hebrew tongue, when he'd speak to them in the Hebrew language, that would make them speak. And the last point I want to mention here, it says in verse 4, he says he gave them license. License is permission. That's what the word literally means. Um... And I don't want to get too political with this, but anytime you get a license 
from the government. What you're doing is saying that the government has authority to give me permission to do something. And this is why I don't believe that we ought to have driver's licenses. Because what you're doing is saying, well, I need to get permission from the state to drive my vehicle, to drive my car. If I just want to travel from here to there, and I want to use a vehicle to do it, I want to use a car to do that, um, I have to get this, this permission from the government that says, okay, you are now have the authority to, to, to get behind a steering wheel and to drive somewhere else. And I, don't, I believe that we have a God-given right to be able to, to, to go from one place to another, no matter how we choose how to do that. Whether it's on a bicycle, or on foot, or on a skateboard, or on a scooter, or on a car, or however we choose to do that, I don't think we need permission from the government to be doing it. I don't think we need a license to do that. And there's so many things that I don't believe that we need a license to do. I don't think we need a license to conduct business. I don't think we should need you know, to get government's permission to do all of these various things that, that they're telling us to do. But um, just understand that, because in this day, we throw around that word license, because it's such a part of our life that, that it's just, it's like normal. Now you're saying, of course, well, I'm going to turn 16, I'm going to get my driver's license, I'm going to do this. And people just kind of lose track of what the word even means. And we see the meaning of the word right here when it says he gave him license to speak. That means he gave him permission. Because Paul was asking him, you know, please let me speak unto the people. He's asking for permission to speak because obviously this guy was arresting him and he had this authority over Paul at that moment because... He was the one that shackled him and was binding him and, you know, and, and carrying him off. So he asked him to speak and he gave him license. And any time you get a license, you understand that that's what it is, it's permission. You're seeking permission. But let's bow right to a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the Bible. And um, we thank you for, for all the great things that we can learn here from Paul. God, I pray that you would please help us um, not to get sucked into some kind of a compromise when we know that, that your word is true, and, and regardless of what it might be, whether it be um, you know, the, the, the music standards that we have in this church, or the preaching standards, or, or whatever standards, I mean, the fa family standards, whatever it is, whatever standards you've set forth, dear God, help us never to back down and to compromise on them because maybe some famous pastor says something different, or, or whatever, or maybe some people are offended by hearing that, and, and we want to quell them somehow. Lord, help us never to have that type of an attitude that we would just rather just, just stick with your word and, and stay with it because that's what the truth is. And um, Lord, I pray that you please strengthen us and just continue to build this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.